This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Al Roth, who is a professor of economics at Stanford University and the author of uh, this book here, um, Who Gets What and Why. And, you know, this book came out, I guess, about seven years ago. Uh, and, you know, it's still so fresh. It, it really is. It really is fresh. Um, you know, you talk about the kidney market and you talk about the market for, for clerks and, you know, for, for lawyers and for, you know, school students in New York and Boston. There's a lot of great case studies. And what, what's, what's interesting, I think, if most people read this is, you know, you're an economist who is you know, done amazing stuff in game theory, but, but you're really an engineer at the end of the day. I mean, you, you trained as an engineer. And, and you even talk about things like economic engineering and, and design economics. And, you know, you're about building solutions. This is, this is not what a lot of people think about when they think of economists, particularly, right, when they think of, of micro e economists. Should we be thinking about kind of economic engineering as a new, new field, a new profession that's just going to keep kind of, kind of growing? Um, is this something we can start giving, I know you have a class in this. Should we think about this as, as like, you know, should we just have degree programs in this? Should we, you know, create a new school of economic engineering? Well, I think it's early to create a new school, but I think it's, it's certainly a field of economics now. Uh, you know, PhD students at Stanford can declare market design as one of their fields. And, um, several Nobel prizes now have been given for, for things that you would call economic engineering. Uh, you know, there's the one I shared with Lloyd Shapley in 2012, but just, uh, year before last, uh, Bob Wilson and Paul Milgram, uh, got a Nobel prize for designing auctions. Uh, so that's a kind of, of economic engineering. That is, we're not just describing existing auctions and matching markets, but we're, we're starting to be able to help to fix them when they're broken and to design new ones when, when new ones are needed. I wonder if we could dig into kind of the intellectual history of this, right? Because, um, as you mentioned in the book, e economists for a long time, it ignored market design, right? So, you know, the neoclassical framework of, uh, you know, the arrow de Brew framework of, of markets is one that kind of abstracts from the, the nitty gritty of, of markets and, um, you know, they would contrast, uh, markets with central planning and central planning. You've got, you know, someone who basically allocates all the, the resources, you know, markets, everything is kind of, at least people believe that, you know, we had this laissez faire system and, and, and in reality, right. There's, there's virtually no markets that resemble those abstract extremes. So, so why is it that the economists focused on studying these, these models, which, you know, did not really reflect the, the nitty gritty of what actually happens on the ground. Well, you know, think about an analogy with biology for a long time, botanists described plants the way they found them. And then over time, you know, uh, agronomists and farmers and, and, uh, you know, other kinds of biologists started to do plant breeding. And more recently there started to be molecular biology where we can insert genes into plants and things like that. And I think a little bit, that's the way economics developed for a long time. We, we took markets as things that happened and our job was to study them. Uh, but one of the things you can study and particularly with the advent of, of game theory in the 20th century, one of the things you can study is just the, the details of how markets work. What, what, what is their design? And once you start studying their design, you can start talking about maybe, uh, maybe helping to, to alter it and, uh, and, and fix it. And of course, unlike plants, the thing about markets is they are, and always have been human artifacts. They're tools that people make to do things. And, uh, and that was always true. It was true when our prehistoric ancestors traded stone tools, but it's become ever clearer as markets have moved onto the internet. You know, no one thinks of Uber as a market for, for uh, rides that just happened. It's a company, you know, engineers built the app. Uh, and you ask whether there might be a new way for economists to earn their living. And I think, I think there are now new ways for economists to earn their living. Um, when I was young, if you met someone 
who was an economist who worked in the private sector. It's very likely that his employer was a bank and his job was to forecast interest rates. But here in Silicon Valley, a lot of the most exciting companies have chief economists who are market designers. You know, there's Hal Varian at Google, there's Michael Schwartz at Microsoft, uh, and, and our PhD graduates at Stanford are often taking jobs at tech companies. And, and they're not, some of them are doing data analysis of various sorts, and, and some of them are doing market design straight out. Yeah. Now, when I was studying economics and, and as an undergrad and then you know, started doing economic history as a, as a PhD student, um, you know, I, I found that the tools that we had available to, to explain a uh, phenomenon that we observed in, in the real world were, you know, quite limited. Right. And so, um, you know, I was looking at, at medieval markets, right. And, um, when you use this framework of like, you know, markets versus hierarchies, um, you know, most things don't kind of fit into either one of those, uh, abstract frameworks. Most things are kind of a, a, a blend of, of the two. And most markets are actually kind of run by, uh, institutions or hierarchies. And, and I remember encountering, I think it was in, in maybe Pollock and Maitland or, you know, I forget where I encountered this, but this idea of, you know, forestalling and, and regrading, right? So, uh, I, I was, I was, you know, excited to encounter that in, in your, in your book because you know, these were, you know, there were lords that, that controlled these, these marketplaces and there were the, these rules, right? Where if, if you intercepted somebody on their way to the marketplace and, and tried to buy their, their, you know, their goods and then kind of, you know, resell them in the marketplace, this was something which was prohibited under, under common law. And so I guess that means that these rules kind of evolved without any necessarily any, you know, clear direction. Sometimes it was because the, you know, the Lords would, would impose these things and as, as a way of maintaining the, 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 the market functioning. And I couldn't find any good explanations for, you know, why this, this, this made, you know, why they did this. Um, but, but it's clear that this is, it's, it's a, these, these restrictions on, on trading or what make trading possible. Um, you know, and you, you dig into this in a lot of different, a lot of different ways. Do you think that, that, that you know, most economists really understand this? I, I went to, I remember it was at the, um, uh, I was at the American Finance Association a couple of years back and there's a, a, a keynote on, you know, what is liquidity? And they rattled off like 50 different definitions of liquidity and then kind of threw up their hands and said, well, we don't really know, you know, what it is. It seems like you have, have you know, part of what you're trying to do is explain, you know, liquidity in, in markets, right? What are the structural requirements to have, you know, markets, uh, you know, how do they get thickness? How do they, you know, uh, get, uh, safety? How do you, these, these features that make them work require rules? Well, you know, the medieval markets you talk about are a good example because the, the economic crime of forestalling was about trading before the market. And I think that when you were studying economic history, the explanation that, that many people gave was that, uh, you wanted to have a tax collector at the market. And so people who traded, uh, before were avoiding taxes on their trades. But when I go to a Sunday morning farmer's market on California Avenue, they also worry about when they open and, and when they don't. And partly it's because you want to make a thick market. You want the market to be open during regular hours. So lots of people can come and, and trade and the, the, the sellers have some interest in not, in not opening earlier than others and starting a, a competition to open earlier and earlier, because they're going to sell a certain number, you know, a certain amount of goods to, to by and large, a given population and it, it makes sense for them to have that concentrated during the morning when, when the, when the, when the, not the Lord, but the, the city of Palo Alto, uh, you know, gives them a license to be open and, uh, and not to compete with each other, to be the very first to open and open half an hour early. And, and that was some of what the forestalling was going on. And I remember when I was reading about medieval markets in England, some of the forestalling trials that they had, you know, you could, you had a right to a market in a certain place and it was on a river and someone could impinge on your market by, by opening up another market on the same river, but nearer to the sea so that, that ships would, would stop there and, and interfere with your market. Uh, 
So I think there are lots of rules, as there are in the New York Stock Exchange, to keep the market thick and to have regular trading hours so that, um, that when you show up at the market, you can be sure that there'll be a market there for you. Right. And you use the term un unraveling, right? And so, you know, markets can, can unravel if uh, these restrictions on time and, and place are, are violated. Um, but, but it's not simply about, you know, limiting the trading to specific locations at specific times, but it's also kind of regulating the, 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 you know, the, the units, right? So you, you talk a bit about, um, uh, you know, trading instead of having continuous time trading, you, you, know, you break the trading up into specific time units it, that also applies presumably to, you know, um, ticks, right? I remember that when we moved from. Uh, you know, stocks that had to be traded at eighths to, you know, now it's like, you know, decimal and even fractions of, of decimals. And so there, there was like an intellectual movement, I think, which argued, you know, the fewer restrictions we have, the, the more efficient, you know, price discovery will be. Um, why do you suppose that movement kind of took off and, and did that movement kind of fail to understand these, these concepts? Well, I think the technology of markets changed when, um, you know, price discovery is a really important part of markets and, and allowing traders to operate freely helps with price discovery up to a point. Uh, and the point I think that, that we may have reached is very fast algorithmic trading where, where, um, uh, you know, microsecond differences in, in the prices of standard Poor's 500, uh, bundles between the Chicago Board of Trade and the New York Stock Exchange uh, can lead to arbitrage opportunities uh, that go to the fastest, not to the people offering the best price. So right now, a lot of uh, trading engines are co-located with, with exchange servers uh, you know, in the same buildings because the speed of light is, is a, a bound on how fast you can find these trades. And these trades have, um, you, you know, a, a, a majority of trades these days are, are algorithmic trades and they make very little money on each trade, but they make many, many trades. Uh, and it's not clear that that's helping price discovery or efficiency because people who are making markets, you know, or offering bids and asks have to take wider spreads in order to defend themselves against having, uh, having traded on a stale bid or ask when, when someone who's a little faster than they, uh, it's new information from, from one of the markets. So, uh, Eric Budish at the university of Chicago, for example, has been at the forefront of talking about, maybe we should start thinking a little bit about slowing and bunching trades, uh, you know, at the level of maybe trading every second, turns out every second is enough to, to accumulate a lot of trades on, on these big exchanges. Uh, and that might help price discovery. Right. And, uh, you don't use the term rent seeking, but you know, this arms race to try to, you know, build out ever faster networks. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's basically a form of unproductive rent seeking, right? You use this example of, you know, the, the, the field with all the dollars falling from the sky. Maybe you can, you can give us recount that example. Cause I thought it was, a, it was a great, great illustration that I could probably steal and use in other, in other domains. So I don't exactly remember it's been a while since I wrote the book, but I think the example was, you know, for some reason, there are helicopters dropping money and for a little while people come and collect it and make some profit. But after a while, the people collecting it are using drones and, you know, bigger and faster drones and they're using up all the resources so that the, they're, you know, they're competing to, to get this money that's falling from the sky and eventually, uh, lots of money is being spent on collecting it. Uh, and, and they're not making big profits anymore. And, and that's sort of socially wasteful that we've invested in billion dollars of drones to, to pick up falling money. And a little bit, that's what the, the high speed trading race is like. I mean, there have been, uh, you know, under, underground cables and then, and then, uh, microwave links, you know, which, which can go straighter, uh, because when you're thinking about the speed of light, the curvature of the earth between New York and Chicago starts to matter. And, and so these are big communications costs that are made to allow, uh, faster trades. Uh, and it's not clear that at that level, you know, this is at an inhuman level, you know, we're, we're talking about trades made in, in, you know, single digit milliseconds, uh, takes you one to 300 
milliseconds to blink your eyes. So these aren't trades that, that people are getting new information about the market and pondering it. These are looking for little arbitrage opportunities um, and arbitrage opportunities that take advantage of the fact that at the millisecond level, prices that are very highly correlated for similar securities in New York and Chicago that are very highly correlated at the one second level aren't correlated at the millisecond level. So, so there's arbitrage that can be made and that causes people who are, who are offering bids and asks to, to increase the spreads and that's a cost to the market. So, uh, again, Eric Budish is the, the person who's been at the forefront of, of trying to figure that out. And I think you describe a solution as, Hey, what if we put a big fence around this field and then, you know, auction off the, the contents of the field and then the proceeds could be, you know, basically were funded back to the, you know, the, the airline passengers or, or whatever. Right. And that would be, I guess, the, the equivalent of you know, uh, limiting the trade to specific, specific times. Exactly. So if you only ran the market once every second, you could, uh, do price discovery. You could look where supply equal demand in, in that second, and people wouldn't have to invest in faster and faster communications and co-locating, uh, because the speed of light doesn't matter anymore when you're, when you're only doing things once a second. So all the technology, billions of dollars of technology that depends on, on getting closer and closer to the physical limits of, of how quickly you can communicate would, would be unnecessary. All those drones picking up dollar bills, uh, would be unnecessary. So in that part of the book, you're, you know, you're talking about, um, the evolution of, of commodity markets and, you know, the, the kind of rules that facilitate, um, you know, active commodity markets, but the bulk of the book is really about kind of matching, uh, markets. And so could, could you talk a bit about the, the difference between the two and, and sort of, you know, why matching markets have been kind of ignored in, uh, in economics until fairly recently. I mean, is it just because, you know, everyone assumes that, you know, economics covers markets where things clear on price and, and when you, when, when, you know, there's other dimensions that, that, you know, it's, it's harder to study or, you know, why have we ignored this massive, I mean, look, all, anybody who gets married participated in, in a matching market. So, you know, we have firsthand experience of matching markets. Well, so I think commodity markets are, are easier to theorize about, uh, and, but, but they also have to be designed. You know, the, one of the things I talk about in the book is that, um, you know, every field of wheat is a little different. What allowed the Chicago board of trade to trade in commodity wheat was, was turning it into commodities. So we don't buy, you don't buy, uh, 5,000 bushels of wheat. You buy 5,000 bushels of, uh, number two, hard red winter wheat and all of those adjectives mean something. And so they, they mean something well enough to find that you don't have to, to inspect them. Uh, and the, the, you know, the trains that are taking them to market can, uh, can mix them together because they're all the same, you know, every, every bushel of, of number two, hard red winter wheat, uh, are, are sufficiently similar. So they're commodities and with commodities, price does all the work. You don't care who you're buying from because it's a commodity. You, you don't care who you're selling to, uh, because. So what you care about is the price, but labor markets, for example, aren't like that at all. You don't just, we don't just hire assistant professors at Stanford by, by lowering the wage until just enough people want to teach at Stanford to, to fill our classes. And, and we don't, uh, admit students by raising tuition until just enough students want to come to, to fill all our, our seats. So, so hiring people and admitting people to college involves other market activities than just price discovery. You have to have applications and interviews and offers and acceptances. And, and we don't make the same offer to just anyone. When we make an offer to someone to hire them, we make an offer to a particular individual. And that's what makes it a matching market, right? That, that you care who you're dealing with. So, uh, some markets, and I've, I've studied some, uh, don't use money at all. But they're still markets because they're they're aggregating privately held information and looking for efficient outcomes. But most markets are somewhere between pure uh, commodity markets where only price discovery is what's important, and and who gets what is determined by by who can afford what and what they want. Um, and and matching markets, you know, pure matching markets maybe don't use money, but but most markets uh, have some element of matching. And in matching markets, you can't 
always just choose what you want because you also have to be chosen. You can't just come to work at Stanford. You have to be hired. You can't just uh, come study at Stanford. You have to be admitted. And, the, and, and similarly, Stanford can't just decide who will be its students or its professors. We have to compete with Berkeley, for example. So, uh, so there are a lot of institutions of matching markets that you can, you can make believe they're like commodity markets. You can talk about labor markets as the price of labor, as if labor were a commodity. And, you know, the Aaron de Brewer framework of, of having all sorts of contingent contracts and you know, markets for everything is, is a powerful theoretical tool for doing that. But to study how markets work and to help them work better, you need to get into the details of their design. Now, if we go back, just going back to commodity markets for a second, right? You know, we have, yes, a couple different types of wheat and a couple different types of, of, of oil. But presumably if, if the number of different types of oil and wheat kind of proliferated and we had, you know, many, many, many more then this, this would presumably, you know, reduce the well, the functioning of these markets, right? So there's like an optimal number at some point, right? I mean, if every, if you, if you've got, if you've got so many different types of, of, of wheat that then all of a sudden you have to get back to doing all this research, right? Or I'm thinking in terms well, of- Well, so I'm not sure about it. Yeah. I'm thinking about like Uber right now. How when, well they're defined. When you go to Uber, right, and you click a You're car, you might get a, you might get a, you know, you might get a Tesla and you might get a, um, you know, a Pinto, right? Um, and, and at some point, presumably there's going to be more differentiation and, and, but right now we don't have enough kind of traffic to support, you know, infinite gradations. Like I want a BMW, like I want to, I want to. Well, so that's right. So Uber just has, Uber, Uber commodifies its stuff. You know, what, what Uber knows, the big thing that Uber knows is that one of the important things to you is to get a car, to be matched with a driver who's near you so he can come quickly and take where you want, where you want to go. And then they know that if you're a big party, you need a bigger car. And if you're a, a swell, you need a fancier car. Uh, so, so they've broken things up like that. But there are markets that are commodity markets that have really a lot of variety. When I walk into the, to a hardware store, they have a lot of different kinds of screws, but they're very well described. If I know what my project is, I could, I know how long a screw and whether it's going to be a wood screw or, or a metal screw, I, I know a lot of things about it. And, and if I can describe that, I can find a screw that's, that's just right, even though there's a whole lot of screws. So, um, so I don't think it's just the number. It has to do partly with the simplicity and the importance of the differences, right? A, a wrong size screw just doesn't work. Uh, so. So we need lots of different screws and there are, I don't know how many, but there are really a lot of different screws. But if, if there's too much variation within a single category, then presumably there'd be a kind of a race to the bottom, right? So if you're getting the same price driving a, you know, BMW is driving a, you know, a Toyota, then it really doesn't make sense to go out and buy a BMW and, and enter into the, you know, Uber business, right? Right. Now Uber seems to regulate the cars, right? Uber cars are pretty nice. Uh, and there's some feedback and they don't, you know, so they curate the drivers somewhat, uh, you know, they have rankings and, and ratings. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, Uber in running its business has to think about the cars. Uh, and of course, if we, if we live long enough to see self-driving cars as, as, uh, very useful, uh, there'll be other issues that they have to think about. And so a big part of your work has been incorporating game theory into market design, right? And, and, and understanding strategic behavior. And, and, you know, when you think about just the typical supply and demand framework for commodities, uh, there's not a whole lot of strategic behavior, right? But in, the, in these matching markets, you know, str strategic behavior becomes e extremely important. And if, if you design a market that's not kind of strategy proofed, then it will begin to unravel. Could you go back and, and talk a bit about like, how did you, I mean, look, you're operations research guy, and then, um, you know, you, you, you started moving into these fields. How did this happen? How did you, how did you kind of, you know, I mean, you recount a bit of it in the book, but, and there's also a recent article in the JEP where you talk a bit about this, but you know, how did you wind up moving into this, this domain? Right. So, so one of the things I studied as a graduate student in operations research was game theory. And, you know, the idea of studying operations is you're going to study how things work in some detail. I mean, that's not, that's not a typical thing for an operations research person to study, is it? It, it wasn't then. And for a long time, it, but it, but it wasn't clear. Game theory was very new. So I got my PhD in 1974. 
right? The, the seven makes it sound like a long time ago. Um, and, um, and game theory was new and it looked like it might find its home in operations research. The, you know, right after I got my PhD, a new journal was formed called Mathematics of Operations Research. And it had three areas and one of them was game theory. And the game theory editor was Bob Oman, you know, the, arguably the best living game theorist. And, um, so it looked like game theory was going to have a fine future in, in operations research, but that isn't the way it turned out. It turned out the future of game theory was in economics. And so my claim when I, when I speak to OR audiences these days is that I didn't change my field. I stood my ground and the disciplinary boundaries moved around me. Uh, so I'm, so I'm an economist, uh, because game theory is about economics, but increasingly it's coming back to operations research because market design is about the operations of certain kinds of companies that run markets. You know, when the, the, the typical operations that were studied when I was a graduate student were the operations of a single company that had something it wanted to maximize, you know, it wanted to, or, or minimize, you know, it wanted to, to minimize its inventory costs or, or maximize its profits or, you know, do something else. And, and you could treat that as a, a unitary objective, but today many of the biggest companies in the world run markets. You know, Google runs a market for ads. Microsoft runs uh, a market for, for cloud and for operating systems. Uh, and, and there are all these new companies like, like Uber that we've been talking about that run markets. And as soon as you're talking about markets, you're talking about people with lots of different objectives. If you are Uber, you have to think about how to motivate the drivers to go where you would like them to go and how to uh, get customers to, to use Uber and not Lyft or public transportation. So all of a sudden you're, you're dealing with people who have lots of privately distributed information and, and many, uh, personal goals that, that aren't all the same. And that brings you into, into game theory and designing the market so that it works well, but we're, we're still talking about operations. And so in my market design courses, I'm now seeing many students from who, who study operations. So, you know, I teach a course on game theory and, you know, we have a whole section on auction markets and, you know, mechanism design and, and markets. Uh, and you know, that's a whole, that's a, that's a huge chunk of, you know, what happens in game theory, but, but, you know, you're, you're looking at something different and, you know, those case studies that you provide for your, you know, when you help to design the, the kidney programs and also the kind of school placement programs and the, and the, um, you know, the, the, the judge, uh, you talk a bit about judges. And, and, uh, and, and lawyer placement markets. These are markets where, you know, no one is, the, the money is just not part of the issue. I mean, nobody's paying for kidneys. No one's paying for, you know, slots in, in high schools. No one's, no one's paying to be, be a clerk. Um, and so these are not commercial, uh, discussions. Um, could you recount kind of the, when, when you started talking to these school board leaders, um, and when you started talking to these, these, these doctors, they must've thought like an economist, what, what's an economist doing? Like, who, who is this guy? What does he think he can offer to us? Did, did they kind of look at you as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, interloper or a, 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 a tourist? How did they think of you? Well, the, the market where that's truest is, is, uh, helping to facilitate kidney transplants. And that was one where, you know, I was talking to doctors about medicine, but where I started is I was talking to doctors about their labor market, the market for new medical graduates and how, how they get their first jobs in the United States. So that one, I think it wasn't that hard to convince them that, uh, that economists were important. And in fact, they approached me, you know, the way I, um, got to redesign the, the medical match, the, the marketplace through which doctors get their first jobs in the United States was I was sitting at my desk in the university of Pittsburgh and the phone rang and on the phone was the director of, of the match. This is in the 1990s. And he asked me if I, if I lead a study to redesign the match or to see if it needed to be redesigned. And, and that was a, an important moment in my career because I, I remember that I, I sort of regretted having picked up the phone because, uh, you know, I knew I was going to have to say yes, because I, I had studied this market and written about it, but I'd always written about it the way economists write about things like these guys have some interesting problems and some of the problems are hard. And I'd written a book on, on matching, a, a book on matching theory. And I, I, I'd used the medical match as an example of, of a market 
that didn't that that sometimes had uh, details about it that that made the problems harder than the simple models that we mostly like to study. So I understood in, in taking that assignment that I, was into, I wasn't going to just be able to say these are hard problems because they were going to become my hard problems. And I was going to have to figure out how to solve them, even when the, the simple ways we used to theorize about them weren't, weren't adequate. Um, so that was a, a great moment for me. And, uh, and it really started me off on, on taking responsibility for all these details that I was studying uh, with great interest, but, but not, not feeling responsible for. Right. And you mentioned in each of these cases, you, you partnered with someone who had kind of more domain expertise. And so it, it seems like, you know, economic engineering requires, on the one hand, uh, this generalized expertise in, in market design, but then the devil's in the details for each of these specific applications, right? I, I think that's exactly right. So I think all of the successful designs that I've been involved in that, when, and when I say successful, I mean designs that have been adopted and implemented successfully and, and have worked for, for years, uh, they've all involved inside champions, right? You know, finding domain experts who could explain to, to the economists, you know, to, to me and my team of economist colleagues, uh, what was going on and what we might be missing and who could listen to us and hear what we're proposing and then help explain that to their colleagues, because it's not enough to have a good design. You have to, uh, it's a collective action problem. You have to get lots of people to participate in, in a marketplace when you want to change its rules. And, and so of course we've had many more failures than we've had successes. So I, th I think the key here in these markets is that you don't have a, a clear kind of hierarchy of, you know, better to worse, right? So when people talk about mating markets or matching markets, you know, it's like, well, the A's match with the A's and the B's match with the B's and the Z's match with the Z's. And in, in all of these, these, you know, in, in all these, these labor markets, it's not quite so, so clear cut, right? So maybe just describe the, the essence of, of the problem where the, the applicants have their preferences, the, the employers have their preferences and, and, you know, why is it so difficult to just, you know, make sure that everybody's preferences are, are, you know, optimized. Well, people have this. So right now we're, we're in the midst of the, the market for new PhD economists. And, you know, I'm a, an economics professor at Stanford. So, so I'm, I'm both on the buy side and the sell side. We have, uh, young people who we're, who we're offering to the market, you know, trying to help them get jobs. And we're also interested in hiring people who, who are on the market. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there are people we might like to hire, but other departments will also like to hire them and we might not be able to hire them. And we have students who would like jobs at, at, would they like good jobs and, and they have to apply to a lot of places to get those good jobs. Cause it's a, it's a hard market and, and they're, they're so, um, you know, so all these departments are competing in on the buy side at hiring people and all the students are competing on the sell side. They're, they're trying to get hired and you can't just choose what you want. You also have to be chosen. So if you just ask me, uh, where I wanted to work, maybe, you know, I might have an answer. Uh, but, but the fact that I work at Stanford means I wanted to work at Stanford and Stanford wanted me to work at Stanford. Both of those things had to happen. And, and so both the, the employers and the potential employees have preferences and they don't always nicely match up. So, you know, I, I was schooled on things like arrows and possibility theorem and, you know, and, and I, I became quite, quite the pessimist, uh, you know, I thought, well, there's, there's no way that you can design a, a system that's, that's, that's essentially, you know, going to make everybody, you know, uh, more or less happy, but, but you, you proved that you, you can, right. Design a system that is, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, there's no incentive to, to try and game the system and, uh, and that it is, is resistant to, to people kind of entering into side deals that might unravel the whole thing. What, what, how did that mo like when, when you discovered that there was a, a solution, I mean, look, economists love solutions. When you discover an equilibrium or a solution, that's when, you know, you're, you're happiest. You know, what, what was that moment like when you realized, Hey, there actually is, uh, a, a, a solution to this problem. 
you know, these, these moments play out over long periods of time. So the work on matching that you're talking about, um, I shared a Nobel prize with Lloyd Shapley and, and what he got the Nobel prize for was his, his, uh, 1960s paper with David Gale that talked about stable matching. They had a paper that, that was called college admissions and the stability of marriage. So, uh, a sort of fanciful title, uh, about matching and, um, there was another paper by, by Shapley and Scarf that came out in the seventies that, that talked about a different kind of matching that they thought about how, how to allocate indivisible goods if you couldn't use money and they used houses as an example. And when I was reading those papers as a, as a, a young new PhD, uh, it, it, it struck me that, that what they were doing is they were doing a very operations researchy kind of thing. They were, they were developing algorithms that took people's preferences as inputs and output various market outcomes, various outcomes that had good properties. And I remember thinking, you know, that's almost like describing how you would design a centralized clearinghouse for, for a marketplace. But if you were designing a centralized clearinghouse, the question would be, how are you going to get those preferences that are the input for the algorithm? And because the thing about preferences is they're private information. If I want to know your preferences, if I want to know whether you would prefer to teach at Stanford or at Berkeley, I have to ask you. Um, and once I ask you, you. Your response might be, what, why do you want to know? How are you going to use my answer? And depending how I'm going to use my, your, your answer, you might be more or less motivated to tell me your true preferences, or you might think to yourself, how can I get the best outcome? You know, what answer should I give to get the best outcome, given how Al is going to use these preferences? And so, so I started to study in the 1970s, how these, how these algorithms would, would fare to that question. Tell me your preferences so I can put them in the algorithm. And I discovered the, the, that there were some limits on, on how much it would always be in people's interest to answer truthfully, but that, that those limits allowed us to make a lot of progress on organizing clearing houses where we could ask people to state their preferences and they would want to tell us the truth so that we could then use those preferences to look for efficient outcomes. So that was. That was long before I thought of actually designing centralized clearinghouses that, that use those tools. So, so this, uh, this discovery was sort of parallel, you know, Vickery's discoveries in an auction space, right? Just trying to, how do you, how do you create like a truth serum that, that gets people right? Cause economists believe in efficiency, but they do so because they think that, you know, people will, their revealed preferences and, and their stated preferences are, you know, are the same. Well, for, for most markets, remember, you're not asked to state your preferences. When you go to buy a car, no one says to you, you know, what, what's your maximum willingness to pay for a Tesla and for a Volkswagen? You just, you know, you go to the dealerships and you make a choice and, uh, depending on the prices and you buy some car and no one has ever asked to your preferences. So, so the idea of revealed preference is often that, that we're going to have to back out from what we think is the equilibrium, what your preferences were. And there are, there are people like Ariel Pecos who, who studies demand systems, who have built powerful tools to allow us to try to understand what is it about a car that causes you to like it and have, you know, willingness to pay, you know, how should we divide up all its attributes to, to understand what makes you demand, uh, automobile automobiles. Um, but, but there's this class of centralized clearinghouses like the ones that, uh, that new doctors get their first jobs where we ask them for their preferences. We ask graduating medical students, what's your first choice job, your second, your third. And it's not that there are no prices in this market. Those jobs all come with salaries, but they're part of the job description. And so that's not what decides who gets what. And then we ask the the employers, the residency programs, who's your first choice applicant, who's your second. And what we want to have is a system that, that makes it worthwhile for them to answer truthfully. And then that produces what we call a stable matching, a matching that has the property that, that if you and I, that it never happens that you and I, uh, uh, an applicant and an employer are not matched to each other, but we would have preferred to be matched to each other than to accept the outcome of the centralized clearinghouse. And as long as there are no pairs like that, then, then everyone will be prepared to accept the, the outcome of the centralized clearinghouse. 
But if there are these blocking pairs, then the centralized clearinghouse may, may lose its force and the market may unravel and people may start making deals before or after that will disrupt the, the centralized marketplace and make it less thick, make it, uh, make, make there fewer opportunities available, uh, for people to, to find the right jobs and the right employees. So, um, so eventually all these pieces came together in nice ways, uh, for, for the medical market, for school choice. Uh, and, and in this very different kind of world for, for kidney exchange, for helping people get kidney transplants, even if, if someone who wants to donate a kidney t t to them isn't compatible. So we have to start rematching the, the patients and the donors. Now, how long did it take for people to learn to trust these systems? You describe a couple of cases where, you know, the schools would kind of hold back a bunch of seats. Uh, they didn't want to put them in the central pool and, um, you know, applicants would try to disguise their preferences. I mean, they wouldn't try, they would basically game it because they, 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 they were worried that if they picked the wrong one, then ultimately they'd wind up with nothing. You know, when you come up with this solution, you ha it, for in order for it to work, you have to convince everybody that it's, it's going to work. Um, how long did it take to, to kind of get buy-in? Cause it seems like trust is, is super, super important right, right. in these markets. So, so it's taken a while and we learned a lot. For instance, in school choice, we, we learned a lot as we went from city to city and, and, and built new systems. Uh, when we started, we thought we're going to help you design a school choice algorithm. And, you know, later on, as we talked to more cities, we started to say, we want to help you design a school choice algorithm and a communications package so that you can convey to people what's going on and, and how it's working. Uh, and, and similarly with the medical match, you know, there are other things going on than the match itself. And so, so. These days, there's some concern about the, the number of applications and interviews, for instance, and how those work. So, so you know, we once again are, are in a position where we, we have to help people understand and maybe change some of the ways that they're interacting in this market, which has a lot of parts, not just the match. Uh, with kidneys, kidney exchange, you know, it's become a standard form of transplantation in the United States over the last uh, 20 years. Um, but it's still not legal in Germany, for example. And, uh, but although there are a bunch of European countries that have started kidney exchange programs, not, not in Germany. And, um, and there's suspicion about international kidney exchange across borders. You know, it turns out some kidney patients are, it's very hard for them to find a, a kidney. And so if you're in a small country, uh, and, and you can only take, you know, one in a, a million kidneys that are, uh, that, that are blood type compatible, then you just won't, won't find one. So, so this past summer, for instance, I was in the United Arab Emirates in connection with, a, a kidney exchange between the UAE and Israel, uh, and the UAE and Israel each have populations of about 10 million. That's just not big enough for, for people who really have a hard time finding a kidney to, to find one, but, but using the data available from both uh, transplant centers, both, both transplant programs, we were able to find a, a match, a three-way match between a, a Jewish Israeli couple, uh, an Arab Israeli couple, and, uh, a couple that just wants to be identified as, as residents of the UAE. Uh, and, and that, you know, saves three people from dying on dialysis it, and it, you know, maybe it helps make a piece as well. So, uh, you know, matching, matching markets are, are all around. Well, you know, you mentioned Stanley Jevons and, and, you know, the, his original article on, you know, why money came to exist, right. And the limitations of a barter. And so this is something economists have, have known for, for a long time, right. That, you know, if you require a mutual coincidence of wants, then you're, you're not going to get a whole lot of transactions, but that was sort of the, the, the dominant way of, of dealing with, with, with kidneys, right. You know, you have to find somebody who wants to give you a kidney and, you know, obviously that's, that's going to be pretty difficult unless somebody, you know, donates a kidney after, after death. Right. Um, so, you know, I guess why was it, was it, what took so long for the, the idea of, you know, cycles or, or, um, you know, chains to, to emerge given that we, we all kind of understand that, that, you know, Mutual coincidence of wants is, is a very, very rare thing in, in this environment. Right, right. Well, so Jevons' point was that money is a great market design invention because barter is hard. And, and he used houses as an example. You know, if, if I had to, if I couldn't, um, 
sell my house and buy another house with the uh, proceeds. Uh, it would be really, it would have been really hard for me to move from Boston to California if I had to trade houses with someone who had a house in California and wanted a house in Boston and we had to, to have this double coincidence of wants. But one of the things that changed since Jevons' time is computers. So it's hard to arrange all the exchanges if you can't use money as you, as you're not allowed to in kidneys, but, but it's no longer impossible. And we started with just pairwise exchange. So remember what kidney exchange is, is there's a patient donor pair. So there's a donor who wants to give the kidney to a patient, but can't because kidneys have to be well matched. So people who love you may not have kidneys that you can use. Uh, and people who love me might not have kidneys that I could use if, if you and I needed kidneys, but it might be that my donor could give you a kidney and your donor could give me a kidney. And that would mean we'd found that double coincidence of wants that allowed a trade. But of course, as Jevons observed, that's a very rare kind of trade. And the trade I just told you about between the UAE and Israel involved three pairs. So if you can look at three pairs, you don't have to find the double coincidence. You can find some more pairs, you could more trades. And if you can look at bigger cycles, you can find more. And we've developed ways to, to look at chains, sometimes long chains of exchanges. Uh, now, this is all done without money. Uh, and economists and philosophers and legislators can spend a lot of time arguing about why it's illegal almost everywhere in the world to, to pay a donor for a kidney. But given that it is one of the, one of the things that, that we've done is, is use computer power to find these, these exchanges that involve coincidence of what they don't have to be double coincidence. They can be much more general. And, and so again, you know, thousands of transplants have been done that way and then lives saved. Um, but, but so far we're, we're doing it all within national borders and National borders are artificial. Again, you know, the, there's a reason why. So, so someone who has a very hard time finding a kidney might still find one in the United States because there are a lot of us. But Israel and the UAE are just small. And even in the United States, we have people who it's so hard for them to find a kidney that they, they don't find one. Uh, but the world is a big place. And kidney disease is one of the top 10 causes of death around the world. So I think one of the next steps in the evolution of kidney exchange is to, to carefully break down some of these uh, artificial boundaries. And one of the reasons the artificial boundaries are there and, and why people are sensitive about them is because of this big shortage of transplantable kidneys, there's, there are black markets and the black markets are run by criminals and they're not, they don't work very well. They're, they're not good for donors. They're not good for patients. And so some people worry that expanding the, the kind of standard medical procedures that we use in the United States and in England and the Netherlands, uh, might encourage black markets. But I think that's a misunderstanding of how legitimate markets compete with black markets. In other words, um, we're familiar with, with both from our ordinary experience, you know, uh, there are illegal markets in narcotics run by criminals. Uh, and you know, when you buy narcotics from criminals, you might get fentanyl mixed in your heroin and it'll kill you. Uh, and there used to be, you know, illegal moonshine whiskey sold by gangsters, but there isn't any more, you know, one for, for, for good or ill, the, the legal sale of alcohol means there's simply no, no easy way for you to buy illegal whiskey sold by gangsters. Instead, you know, you can buy expensive whiskey aged in, in oak barrels, uh, and, and, you know, no one goes blind from it or, uh, you know, gets lead poisoning. Um, so, so I think the discussion of kidneys is going to have to be reoriented towards how can we make more legal opportunities, more ethical, uh, well-regulated opportunities available in, in real hospitals that take proper care. And by doing so limit the scope of black markets in, in kidneys. But, but some of the discussion is, is people are afraid that just allowing kidney transplants will, will increase black markets instead of decreasing them. And I think that's just a mistake. So I think, you know, we all understand that the bigger the market, the thicker the market, and the more likely we're going to have, you know, people get their wants satisfied. Um, and so presumably, you know, expanding outside of the U.S., just like expanding outside of New England, you know, is going to make everybody better off. But, you know, part of this seems like, um, like you said, a little bit nationalistic, kind of like the rules that required us to... Um, utilize Alaskan oil, right, inside the U.S., when it made a lot more sense to send Alaskan oil to Japan and import, like, Venezuelan oil, 
but that people don't kind of see them as, as, as fungible, right? In the same way that, you know, buying carbon offsets instead of reducing your carbon emissions, that doesn't seem to, you know, go over well with, with, with people. But there's, there seems to be another problem, which is you, and you discuss, which is sort of the, the politics of it and why certain hospitals are kind of reluctant to give up their control. And when I was reading about this, it reminded me of the, you know, the difficulty that we've had in kind of setting up, um, you know, swaps execution facilities and, and central clearing houses in the world of swaps, right? Because the, 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 the banks want to kind of control their, their own, you know, dark pool, so to speak, right? They don't really want to have, uh, be part of this, this broader market because they, they enjoy their market power. How do you, how do you overcome, you know, institutions? You talk about some hospitals that didn't want to, didn't want to join. How do you, how do you, this, it seems like this requires an awful lot of persuasion on, on the part well, of the. Some, some hospitals still, some American hospitals still haven't joined kidney exchange, but it's become a very standard form of transplantation. So as it does, uh, you know, more hospitals join and patients may become aware of, of the possibility and, and choose their transplant centers in order to, to maximize their welfare. So there's a kind of competition that goes on at that stage too. So I think that as it becomes more regular and more standard, it, it becomes more attractive and easier to do. So that's been a slow process, but, but now, you know, about 20% of the American living donor transplants are done through kidney exchange. So we're, we're solidly established in the United States as a, a standard medical tool. Um, but, but there are lots of things, you know, it's interesting to study which markets get social support and which ones don't. And one of the things I study and talked about a bit in the book are, are what I call repugnant transactions, which are transactions that people object to, not because of their, their obvious self-interest, but, but often in, in terms that are phrased in moral terms and the, you know, which these are, which markets get support and which don't, and which bans on markets get support and which don't vary from place to place. So before COVID, I was in Germany talking about, um, kidney exchange and surrogacy and prostitution. And the interesting thing, the reason it's interesting to talk about those things in Germany is their laws are exactly the opposite of ours. The only one of those that's legal in Germany is prostitution, but surrogacy and kidney exchange are illegal. Whereas here in California and in most of the United States, uh, surrogacy is a little spotty on a couple of states still, but, but you can hire someone to, to bear a child for you in California. And we have, you know, time tested ways of doing that, that, that mostly work out very well for families. And, uh, of course you can get a kidney exchange, but prostitution is illegal. Um, so, you know, two wealthy countries that have very different laws about, about what things should be legal and illegal. And that's quite common around the world. So, so I'm one of the things I'm working on now, you know, trying to understand better is what's involved in markets, getting social support and, and, uh, and not, and what's involved in being able to ban markets or not. So, so I just, uh, had a paper come out and the first line, this isn't an exact quote, but it's something, the, the first sentence says something like. Why is it so easy to buy drugs and so hard to hire a hitman? And, you know, in the United States, we have a war on drugs. And of course we have a war on hitmen. You know, if we, if we find drug dealers or hitmen, we put them in jail for a long time, but our prisons are, our federal prisons have, you know, 40 something percent, uh, drug convictions. And there are almost no hitmen. I mean, they're, they're, you know, there, there may be some hitmen, but, but, you know, murder is just less of a problem in the United States than drug overdoses are. And most of the murders are by people who, who, you know, know and love the victim. You know, it's mostly the people who, it's mostly your friends who kill you, not, uh, not hired killers. Whereas, whereas, you know, drug dealers, it's, it's mostly, you know, it's a commercial operation run by international cartels. So, but we try really hard to stop both of them and we're successful with hitmen, you know, but not with drugs. So. You know, so that's a, a problem that, that economists should think about, you know, maybe, maybe there are better ways to, to deal with drug addiction than to treat it as a crime. Maybe we should be more concentrating on drug addicts as patients and then thinking about how to, how to deal with them through, you know, social work and medical interventions, uh, more than we do. Uh, and it's not that it isn't a serious problem. It's, it's not that we want lots of drug addiction. Um. But, but may, but, you know, when you look at a market like, like drugs, you, you say to yourself, you know, maybe we should 
shift our emphasis because things aren't working as well as we would like. Whereas when you look at the market for hitmen, you say, you know, things are working just, just fine. You know, by and large, being a hitman is not a good profession. Uh, and let's keep it that way by, by, you know, putting them in jail for a long time, whenever we find them, um, it's working better for hitmen than for, for drugs. Well, well, I think most of the stories in the book are success stories, but there, there's one story that I, I was struck by, which was the market for, um, judicial clerks. And, and, and this seems to be, a, a just every attempt to solve this problem, you know, fails. And, and it's surprising, right? Because judges are supposed to be, you know, creatures of, of law. And, and every time they try to come up with a solution, they, they seem to, they all kind of, um, engage in forestalling, right? They all kind of unravel the, the market. Um, and this, you know, this, this makes people lose a little bit of their faith in, in judges. What is it about that, that market that, that why does it keep, keep unraveling? So, so judges are very hard to regulate. They, you know, judges are laws unto themselves and, uh, the various judicial conferences have tried to make rules about how judges should run their, the labor market by which they hire clerks. And these have mostly failed. So if you know someone who, uh, is graduating from law school this year and is going to go be a clerk, you know, a fancy job for a, a federal appellate judge, that person probably got their job two years ago, you know, in, you know, in the summer after their first year of law school. So there's obviously something inefficient about that because the judges would like to learn a lot more about the progress through law school of, of their clerks, but, but competition to go earlier has, has time and again, moved them back to early hiring after periods in which they sort of coordinate on late hiring and then people start to cheat. So. So judges turn out to be very hard to regulate. Now, is it because the judges think that it's just an issue of self-control and, and, uh, and, and, you know, if, if they can all just restrain, I mean, don't they understand the, the, the prisoner's dilemma? <laughs> like, don't they, shouldn't they understand the, 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 the judges contrast? understand it, but, but again, different judges have different preferences. If, if all law students were hired as clerks late, then that would help the most, the most prestigious judges. And so judges who are a little less prestigious, but still have this very prestigious job to offer, they would like to go a little earlier, you know? So if you are a, a famous judge in the, in the first circuit in, or in the DC circuit, you're in Washington, DC, your circuit gets all sorts of interesting cases and I'm somewhere in the Midwest, but I'm an appellate court judge. One of the things I can do is I can offer some law student a job. Uh, and, and, you know, the, one of the things about the law market is law students don't break promises made to to appellate judges. So, so if I offer someone a job and he takes it, then by the time you sitting in Washington, get around to offering him a better job, he's, he's already taken and, and that might be good for me. Uh, so, so it's a hard market to control, especially since judges are hard to control. Well, last question. Uh, there seem to be a lot of other arenas where we could come up with similar schemes, uh, whether it's placing our PhD students, whether it's, um, you know, placing students into MBA programs, right? Maybe we could learn a little bit from the city of New York, uh, with respect to that, um, you know, dating, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like, uh, uh, a website like, you know, match or, or, or bumble, you, you know, allows people to just insert all their preferences. And then we have, you know, some kind of, um, assignment. It's, it's much more, more like a, a normal market, um, you know, how would, where do you see the, the opportunities for, um, for, for introducing schemes, um, similar to the ones that we have? Well, so, so I don't see centralized clearinghouses as the, as the prototypical market design. You know, we, we started with markets that, that, that uh, responded to that kind of design, uh, in a sense, because they're easier to, to, for us to analyze and organize, but the dating market, you know, one of the big problems is search. It's not that you know, it's, it. As a medical student, you can well form after interviewing it for jobs, you can form preferences over those jobs, but the, the dating market is, uh, you know, there's a lot of fish in the sea, as they say, and, and forming preferences, you know, search is a big part of that and, and facilitating that search and, and making the market uncongested so that it's not full of spam emails, you know, things like that are, are going to be the market design questions that are important. Um, so, uh. So a lot, you know, most markets will remain relatively decentralized and we have to think about how to organize, organize them so that they work well. Um, but there are matching markets 
that are working very badly. And one of the ones that's obviously working badly now is the market for resettling refugees and, and other kinds of, of migrants from countries that are in distress. And, you know, it's a matching market in the sense that refugees can't just choose where they'll get asylum, but neither can countries effectively control their borders and just choose who will come. So we have to have a better way of, of having people move from where they are to where they, you know, where, where they are and are unsafe to where they could be safe and not have that involve, you know, dangerous journeys by foot or by boat that, that kill lots of people. You know, that's, that's not how we travel when we go to Europe or, uh, you know, from South America to North America. And, uh, we there's going to be, there's going to continue to be a lot of human migration. And one of the things that we and our children are going to have to learn how to do is how to handle that. And that's a problem of a matching market. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, Alice, thanks so much for joining me. Um, this book, we barely, Thank you. we barely even scratch the surface. There's just so much uh, richness in here uh, and in the rest of your work, who gets what and, and why. Uh, thanks so much, Al. So, see Thank you. you soon. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 